Ms. Hutchinson, I want to play you a clip of one of our meetings when you described a call on January 4th that you received from National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien on the same topic, potential violence on January 6th. I received a call from Robert O'Brien, the National Security Advisor. He had asked if he could speak with Mr. Meadows about potential violence, words of violence that he was hearing that were potentially going to happen on the Hill on January 6th. I had asked if he had connected with Tony Ornato because Tony Ornato had a conversation with him, with Mark, about that topic. Robert had said, I'll, I'll talk to Tony, and then um, you know, I don't know if Robert ever connected with Mark about <laughs> this is fucking issue. Ms. Apologize for the misadventure. for us no, Mr. Ornato's responsibilities as right. Deputy Chief of Staff. Deputy Chief right. of Staff position at the White House. Not great for content, I'll give you that. Arguably but he's in the hospital right now. Positions that somebody can hold. They're in charge of all security protocol for the campus and all the presidential protectees. Do and I want to go for round three? Not first family, but anything that requires security for any individual that has uh, presidential protection, so the chief of staff or the um, national security advisor, as well as the vice president's team too. Tony would oversee all of that, and he was the conduit for security protocol between White House staff and the United States Secret Service. Thank you. And you also described a brief meeting between Mr. Ornato and Mr. Meadows on the potential for violence. Uh, the meeting was on January 4th. They were talking about the potential for violence on January 6th. Let's listen to a clip of that testimony. Remember, Mr. Ornato had talked to him about intelligence reports. I remember Mr. Ornato coming in and saying that we had intel reports saying that there could potentially be violence on the, on the 6th. You also told us about reports of violence and weapons that the Secret Service were receiving on the night of January 5th and throughout the day on January 6th. Is that correct? That's correct. There are reports that police in Washington, D.C. had arrested several people with firearms or ammunition following a separate pro-Trump rally in Freedom Plaza on the evening of January 5th. Are those some of the reports that you recall hearing about? They are. Of course, the world now knows that the people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th had many different types of weapons. When a president speaks, the Secret Service typically requires those attending to pass through metal detectors, known as magnetometers, or MAGs for short. The Select Committee has learned that people who willingly entered the enclosed area for President Trump's speech were screened so they could attend the rally at the Ellipse. They had weapons and other items that were confiscated. Pepper spray, knives, brass knuckles, tasers, body armor, gas masks, batons, blunt weapons. And those were just from the people who chose to go through the security for the president's event on the ellipse not the several thousand members of the crowd who refused to go through the mags and watched from the lawn near the Washington Monument. The Select Committee has learned about reports from outside the magnetometers and has obtained police radio transmissions identifying individuals with firearms, including AR-15s, near the ellipse on the morning of January 6th. Let's listen. There's an individual entry, to be a white male, about six feet tall, thin build, brown cowboy boots. He's got blue jeans and a blue jean jacket, and underneath the blue jean jacket, the complainants both saw a stock with AR-15. He's gonna be with a group of individuals, about five to eight, five to uh, eight other individuals. Two of the individuals in that group at the base of the tree near the porta potties were wearing green fatigues, green out draft style fatigues, about five eight five nine skinny, uh, skinny white males, brown cowboy boots. They had Glock style pistols in their waistband. Eighty seven thirty six with the message that subject um, weapon on his right hip. Yeah, he's in the tree. Motor one, make sure BPD knows they have an elevated threat in the tree south side of Constitution Avenue. Look for the don't turn on me flag, American flag face mask, cowboy boots, weapon on the white right side hip. 
But got three men walking down the street in fatigue with giant AR-15, copy at 14 for independence. AR-15s at 14th and Independence. As you saw in those emails, the first report that we showed, we now know was sent in the eight o'clock hour on January 6th. It's talked about people in the crowd wearing ballistic helmets and body armor, carrying radio equipment and military grade backpacks. The second report we showed you on the screen was sent by the Secret Service in the 11 a.m. hour, and it addressed reports of a man with a rifle near the ellipse. Ms. Hutchinson, in prior testimony, you described for us a meeting in the White House around 10 a.m. in the morning of January 6th involving Chief of Staff Meadows and Tony Ornato. Were you in that meeting? I was. Let's listen to your testimony about that meeting and then we'll have some questions. I think the last time we talked, you mentioned that um, some of the weapons that people had at the rally included flight poles, oversized um, sticks or fly poles, uh, bear spray. Is there anything else that you recall hearing about the, uh, the people who would gather on the left hand? I recall Tony and I having a conversation with Mark probably around 10 a.m., 10, 15 a.m., where I remember Tony mentioning knives, guns in the form of pistols and rifles, um, bear spray, body armor, spears, and flagpoles. Spears were one item, flagpoles were one item, and then Tony had relayed to me something to the effect of these effing people are fastening spears onto the ends of flagpoles. Ms. Hutchinson, here's a clip of your testimony regarding Mr. Meadows' response to learning that the rally attendees were armed that day. What was Mark's reaction, Mr. Meadows' reaction, to this list of weapons that people had in the crowd? When Tony and I went in to talk to Mark that morning, Mark was sitting on his couch and on his phone, which was something typical. And I remember Tony just got right into it. I was like, sir, I just want to let you know, and informed him, like, this is how many people we have outside the mags right now. These are the weapons that we're known to have. It's possible he listed more weapons off that I just don't recall. Um, and gave him a brief but and concise explanation, but also fairly fairly thorough. And I remember distinctly Mark not looking up from his phone. And I, I remember Tony finishing his explanation and it taking a few seconds for Mark to say something to the point where I almost said, Mark, did you hear him? Um, and then Mark chimed in and was like, all right, anything else? Still looking down at his phone. And Tony looked at me and I looked at Tony and Tony said, no sir, do you have any questions? It's like, what are you hearing? And I looked at Tony and I was like, sir, he just told you about what was happening down at the rallies. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I know. And then he looked up and said, have you talked to the president? And Tony said, yes sir, he's aware too. He said, all right, good. He asked Tony if Tony had informed the president. Yes. And Tony said yes, he had. So, Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that Mr. Ornato told the president about weapons at the rally on the morning of January 6th? That's what Mr. Ornato relayed to me. And here's how you characterize Mr. Meadows' general response when people raised concerns about what could happen on January 6th. So at the time, in the days leading up to the 6th, there were lots of public reports about how things might go bad on the 6th, and even the potential for violence. If I'm hearing you correctly, what stands out to you is that Mr. Meadows did not share those concerns, or at least did not act on those concerns. The game's all in one disc, so the journey never stopped. But other people raised them to, to him, like in this exchange, you mentioned that Mr. Ornato pulled him aside. That's correct. Ms. Hutchinson, we're going to show now an exchange of texts between you and Deputy Chief of Staff Ornato. Um, and these text messages uh, were uh, exchanged while you were at the ellipse. Um, in one text, uh, you write, but the crowd looks good from this vantage point as long as we get the shot. He was effing furious. And the text messages also stress that President Trump kept mentioning the OTR 
an off the record movement. We're going to come back and ask you about that in a minute. But could you tell us, first of all, who it is in the text who was furious? The he in that text that I was referring to was the president. And uh, why was he furious, Ms. Hutchinson? He was furious because he wanted the arena that we had on the ellipse to be maxed out at capacity for uh, all attendees. The advance team had relayed to him that the mags were free flowing. Everybody who wanted to come in had already come in, but he still was angry about the extra space and wanted more people to come in. And did you go to the rally in the presidential motorcade? I, I was there, yes. And were you backstage uh, with the president and other members of his staff and family? I was. And you told us, Ms. Hutchinson, about particular comments that you heard while you were in the tent area. When we were in the offstage announce area tent behind the stage, he was very concerned about the shot, meaning the photograph that we would get because the rally space wasn't full. Um, one of the reasons, which I previously stated, was because he wanted it to be full and for people to not feel excluded because they had come far to watch him at the rally. Um, and he felt the mags were at fault for not letting everybody in. But another leading reason, and likely the primary reason, is because he wanted it full and he was angry that we weren't letting people through the mags with weapons, what the Secret Service deemed as weapons and our, our weapons. <laughs> But when we were in the offstage announced tent, I was part of a conversation. I was in the I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing mags away. Just to be clear, Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that the president wanted to take the mags away and said that the armed individuals were not there to hurt him. That's a fair assessment. The issue wasn't with the amount of space available in the official rally area uh, only, but instead that people did not want to have to go through the mags. Let's listen to a portion of what you told us about that. In this particular instance, it wasn't the capacity of our space, it was the mags and the people that didn't want to come through. And that's what wow. Tony had been trying to relay to him that morning. You know, it's not the issues that we encountered on the campaign. We have enough space, sir. They don't want to come in right now. They they have weapons that they don't want confiscated by the Secret Service. And they're fine on the mall. They can see you on the mall. And they want to march straight to the Capitol from the mall. The president apparently wanted all attendees inside the official rally space and repeatedly said, quote, they're not here to hurt me. And, and just to, to be clear, not so, really. um, the city. he was told again in, in that conversation, or was he told again in that conversation that people couldn't come through the mags because they had weapons? Correct. And um, that people, and he, his response was to say they can march to the Capitol from, in, from the ellipse. Something to the effect of take the effing mags away, they're not here to hurt me, let them in, let my people in. They can march to the Capitol after the rally's over. They can march from they can march from the ellipse. Take the effing mags away. Then they can march to the Capitol. Ms. Hutchinson, what we saw when those clips were playing were photos provided by the National Archives showing the president in the offstage tent before his speech on the ellipse. You were in some of those photos as well. And uh, I just want to confirm that that is when you heard the president say the people with weapons weren't there to hurt him and that he wanted the Secret Service to remove the magnetometers. That's correct. In the photos that you displayed, we were standing towards the front of the tent with the TVs, really close to where he would walk out to go onto the stage. Th these conversations happened two to three minutes before he took the stage that morning. Let's reflect on that for a moment. President Trump was aware that a number of the individuals in the crowd had weapons and were wearing body armor. And here's what President Trump instructed the crowd to do. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. 
anyone you want, but I think right here we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And the crowd, as we know, did proceed to the Capitol. It soon became apparent to the Secret Service, including the Secret Service teams in the crowd, along with White House staff, that security at the Capitol would not be sufficient. I had two or three phone conversations with Mr. Renato when we were at the Ellipse, and then I had four men on Mr. Renato's detail with me in between those individuals and then a few other bodies on the ground, just Secret Service doing advance. They were getting notifications through their radios, and Mr. Ordano in one phone conversation had called me and said, make sure the chief knows that they're, they're getting close to the Capitol, it's, um, they're having trouble stacking bodies. Ms. Hutchinson, when you, you said they were having trouble stacking bodies, did you mean... <laughs> needed more people to defend the Capitol from the rioters? It was becoming clear to us and to the Secret Service that Capitol Police officers were getting overrun at the security barricades outside of the Capitol building. And they were having short, they were short people to defend the building against the rioters. And uh, you mentioned that Mr. Ornato was conveying this to you because he wanted you to tell Mr. Meadows. Uh, so did you did you tell Mr. Meadows uh, that people were getting closer to the Capitol and that Capitol Police was having challenge, difficulty? After I had the conversation with Mr. Meadows, Mr. after I had the conversation with Mr. Renato, I went to have the discussion with Mr. Meadows. He was in a secure vehicle at the time making a call. So when I had gone over to the car, I went to open the door to let him know and he had immediately shut it. I don't know who he was speaking with. Um, it wasn't something that he regularly did, especially when I would go over to give him information. So I was a bit taken aback, but I didn't think much of it, and thinking that I was, would be able to have the conversation with him a few moments later. And were you able to have that conversation a few moments later? Probably about 20 to 25 minutes later. There was another period in between where he shut the door again, um, and then when he finally got out of the vehicle, we had the conversation. But at that point, there was a backlog of information that he should have been made aware of. And so you opened the door to the control car and Mr. Meadows pulled it shut? That's correct. And you did that two times? That's correct. And when you finally were able to give Mr. Meadows the information um, about the violence at the Capitol, what was his reaction? He almost had a lack of reaction. I remember him saying, all right, something to the effect of how much longer is, does the president have left in his speech? Again, uh, much of this information about the potential for violence um, was known or learned before the onset of the violence, early enough for President Trump to take steps to prevent it. He could, for example, have urged the crowd at the Ellipse not to march to the Capitol. He could have condemned the violence immediately once it began, or he could have taken multiple other steps. But as we will see today and in later hearings, President Trump had something else in mind. One other question at this point, Ms. Hutchinson, were you aware of concerns that White House counsel Pat Cipollone or Eric Hirschman had about the language President Trump used in his ellipse speech? There were many discussions the morning of the 6th about the rhetoric of the speech that day. In my conversations with Mr. Hirschman, he had relayed that we would be foolish to include language that had been included at the president's request, which had lines along to the effect of fight for Trump, we're gonna march to the Capitol, I'll be there with you, fight for me, fight for what we're doing, fight for the movement. Um, things about the Vice President at the time, too. Both Mr. Hirschman and White House Counsel's Office were urging the speechwriters to not include that language for legal concerns and also for the op optics of what it could portray the President wanting to do that day. And we just heard the President say that he would be with his supporters as they marched to the Capitol. Even though uh, he did not end up going, he certainly 
wanted to. Um, some have questioned whether President Trump genuinely plans to come here to the Capitol on January 6th. In his book, Mark Meadows falsely wrote that after President Trump gave his speech on January 6th, he told Mr. Meadows that he was, quote, speaking, meta speaking metaphorically about the walk to the Capitol. As you will see, Donald Trump was not speaking metaphorically. 